Thank you. <laughs> in Tarshish, a glamorous career in religion is no proper destination for a pastor. Once on board this Tarshish destined ship, though, it's not easy to get off. The accommodations are pleasant, the touring companions engaging. Why would anyone want anything else? Jonah was thrown off. If there are no sailors around to throw us off, we have to muster the effort ourselves and jump. And the almost certain consequence of this is death by drowning or career aside. <laughs> Jonah didn't drown. He was swallowed by a great fish and so saved. And his first action in this new condition, this submarine condition, is prayer. This is the center of the story, a center that's located in the belly of the fish. The drowning of religious careerism is resurrected now into pastoral vocation. We become what we are called to be. And we become what we are called to be by praying. And we start out by praying in the belly of the fish. And the belly of the fish is a place of confinement, a tight, restricted place. And the ship to Tarshish was headed for the western horizon, a limitless expanse of sea with the lure of the mysterious and beckoning unknown through the Straits of Gibraltar and beyond. The gates of Hercules, Atlantis, Hesperides, Ultima Thule. Religion always plays on these sublime aspirations, these erotic drives for completion and wholeness. And Jonah, who is heady with this potent elixir and cruising confidently under full sails, the sea breeze and the salt tang deepening the sensory anticipation of a thrilling life in the service of God, finds himself instead in the belly of a fish. The belly of the fish is the unattractive opposite to everything Jonah had set out for. The belly of the fish was a dark, dank, probably stinking cell. I want to introduce the word escasis. Escasis, a Greek word, it's to spirituality, what a training regimen is to an athlete. It's not the thing itself, but it's the means to maturity and to excellence. Without escasis, we're at the mercy of glands and weather. Escasis is the spiritual equivalent to the old artistic idea that talent grows by its very confinement in some respect that the genie's strength comes from confinement in the bottle. The creative artist and the praying pastor work common ground here. Without confinement, without the intensification resulting from compression, there is no energy worth speaking of. This is not an option for artists or for pastors. This is not an item that may or may not be incorporated in the creative or the spiritual life. This is required. The particular ways, the particular escasis that each person embraces varies. But without an escasis, a time and place of confinement concentration, there is simply no energy of spirit. Spirituality requires context. Always. Boundaries, borders, limits. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's confinement. That's location. No one becomes more spiritual 
by becoming less material. No one becomes exalted by ascending in a gloriously colored hot air balloon. Mature spirituality requires a scasis, which is a kind of grounding, a training regimen custom designed for each individual in community, and then continuously monitored and adapted as development takes place and conditions vary. It can never, and I insist on this, it can never be imposed from without a mechanical or programmed regime. It must be organically grown in locale. A scasis must be context sensitive. And it not infrequently founders on just this shoal, instead of beginning with a careful determination of the actual conditions of this particular life and then a practice that's respectful and congruent with them, it often is the reverse of that, a punishing of the flesh an angry reprisal against limitations that flesh and geography and genetics comprise. And all those piously lurid accounts of the discipline, self-flagellation, hair shirts, spike beds, that kind of thing, have ruined the word ascetic for many. So that's why I've abandoned ascetic and I'm using escasis. The conditions in which pastors pursue our vocations make it a matter of urgency that, requ that we require, that we acquire an escasis and soon. These conditions in which we work are environmentally dangerous and uncongenial to either personal or vocational holiness. We work out our vocations in congregational denominational and ego conditions, all of which conspire against what we're trying to do. Denomination here, congregation here, and the ego ricocheting back and forth between them. <clears throat> the institution that ordained me, the congregation that called me, and then me. When I was ordained and started this work, I thought we were all together on this. I thought the denomination that ordained me, the congregation that called me, and my own sense of wanting to do the will of God, this would make a powerful team to pull me into my pastoral vocation. And it turned out that all three of us were thinking a lot more about Tarshish than about Nineveh. And teamed up, they made Tarshish seem like a sure thing. Let me talk about these conditions. I'm talking about the conditions just to instill a sense of urgency, desperateness, how important it is to get an escasis. I was and am grateful to the ecclesiastical institution that put me to work, ordained me, put me to the task of starting a new church. They spent a lot of money on me. They provided encouragement, advice, counsel, they gave me access to a tradition in theology and polity that was foundational and stabilizing to me. And I want to be clear about this, that at no time in this process that I'm recounting did I repudiate this institution, nor do I now. What I did learn, though, was that in addition to being a sinner myself, a doctrine which is very key in my tradition of theology, I think it is in yours too, the institution is also a sinner. I didn't mention that. <laughs> and in those early years of my ordination, I didn't understand the depth and the prevalence of institutional sin. But I caught on. <laughs> One of the duties I had as an organizing pastor of a new congregation was to prepare a monthly report on my work and mail it to my denominational superiors in New York City. It wasn't a difficult task, but it took a day's work. The first page was statistical, how many calls I made, how many people attended worship, the committees that we had meeting, progress on building plans, financial reports on the offerings. And then this was followed by several pages of what was called theological pastoral reflection on my sense of ministry. What I understood of God's presence in my work, theological ruminations on church, 
mission, areas of inadequacy that were showing up in my ministry, strengths and skills that seemed to be emerging. After a few months of doing this, I got the feeling that they weren't reading the second part. So I thought I'd test out my impression and have a little fun at the same time. <laughs> so the next month after dutifully compiling all this statistical data, I turned to page two and described as best I could a long, <coughs> slow slide into depression that had been going on for the last few weeks. I had difficulty sleeping. I couldn't pray. I was getting the work done in a kind of robotic way, but there was no spirit in it, no zest. And having feelings like this, um, I wondered if I should go for some counseling and could they suggest somebody. Getting no response, I upped the ante. <laughs> the next month, I developed a drinking problem. <laughs> too bad, but it did become evident one Sunday in the pulpit when one of the elders had to complete the sermon for me. <laughs> People were understanding, but I really felt I was at a point where I needed some treatment. How could I go about getting it? Still no response. <laughs> I got bolder. The next month I cooked up an affair. <laughs> It started out innocently enough as I was attempting to comfort a woman through an abusive marriage, but something happened in the middle, and somehow we ended up in bed together, except it wasn't bed, it was the back pew of the church, and <laughs> the women coming in to arrange the flowers for Sunday found us, and I thought it was going to be all over for my ministry there, but it turned out in that community they loved swingers, and attendance doubled the next week. <laughs> But I was worried about my falling apart kind of behavior, and I needed help. Could they help me? <laughs> Next, I reported some innovations I was making in the liturgy. This was in the 60s, and there was a lot of liturgical reform going on. And um, ours was really dull. I had read some scholarly guesses about a mushroom cult in Palestine in the first century in which Jesus was almost certainly involved, and I thought it was worth a try. So I, I, I arranged for the purchase of some mushroom caps. It was peyote, I think, and uh, we introduced them at our next celebration of the Eucharist. Well, it was a terrific experience. People went and said they'd never had a worship experience like that before. <laughs> But I didn't want to do anything in violation of our church constitution. I couldn't find anything in our book of orders that said this. Could they advise me? Well, these writing days were getting to be a lot of fun. I, <laughs> month after month, I send in these stories of the men and women, uh, to the men and women who were overseeing me. I'd write these in my study. I'd take them and I'd read them to my wife. We'd laugh and we'd laugh and I'd send them off, and I never did get a response. <laughs> well, after three years of this, uh, <laughs> I was released from their supervision. Um, as a pastor and congregation, we were now financially self-supporting, and we were on our way, and I went to New York for what they called a debriefing. <laughs> and they asked me to evaluate their supervision over the last three years, and I said, well, it was wonderful. The checks always arrived on time, and I had nothing to complain of, except I, it did bother me that they never read my reports. And they said, oh, we did. We do. Uh, that's, that's the most important part of the report for us. And they said, well, how about the time I had the drinking problem, and how about the time I told you about the affair, and... Well, it was a wonderful moment. You... <laughs> you know how some people kind of do replays of Abbott Costello films all over, over and over again? I do it. I do that with that scene. I just replay that and laugh and laugh. And laugh. <laughs> it occurred to me not long ago that those reports are all in files someplace. <laughs> I might make it with 
Tammy and Jimmy yet. <laughs> the laughter and the fun of those days was a cover, you understand, for a pretty deep disappointment. I had discovered that spiritually, vocationally, I was on my own. The people who ordained me and took responsibility for my work were interested in financial reports, in attendance graphs, in program planning. They were not interested in me. They were not interested in my ordination. They were not interested in what I was learning now to call my vocation. There was a deeper discovery to be made, and that that I was naive and mistaken to expect them to do that. Spiritual direction doesn't come from institutions. The institution is necessary, has its proper place. I couldn't function without it. I really couldn't. None of you could. But I was mistaken to look for my spiritual nurture there, expect vocational counsel from there. It's still a condition, a condition with which I work all the time. I have to know the nature of the condition. The congregation is the other major condition in which I work, you work, and there's major relearning to be done here, at least for me. One of the things that shocked me was how naive I was in matters of religion. I don't blame myself too much now because I find that a lot of pastors are naive in the same way. We assume that people want more religion. And that in wanting more religion, they want more of God. And in wanting more of God, they want more of God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We assume that when they gather in our congregations and ask us to lead them in prayer, they want us to lead them to the throne of a holy God. And nothing could be farther from the truth. The people in our congregations are, in fact, shopping for idols. They enter our churches with the same mindset in which they go to the shopping mall to get something that will please them or satisfy an appetite or a need. John Calvin saw the human heart as a relentlessly efficient factory for making idols. Well, when you join John Calvin to Henry Ford, you've got assembly line production. <laughs> and that's what I had. Congregations commonly see the pastor as the quality control engineer in that factory. And the moment we accept the condition, hardly knowing what we're doing, we defect from our vocation. The people who gather in our congregations want things to work better. They want a life that's more interesting. They want help through a difficult time. They want meaning and significance in their ventures. They want God in a way but certainly not a jealous God, not the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mostly, they want to be their own God and stay in control, but have ancillary idle assistance for the hard parts, which the pastor is supposed to be able to show them how to get. We live in golden calf country. It's easy and attractive to become a successful pastor like Aaron in our countries. All our theological texts tell us this. We're well schooled in this reality. But somehow we manage to obliterate the memory of those texts the minute we start working in our pastoral vocation. We're taught that it's characteristic of post Eden human beings to try to be their own gods and that this characteristic is persistent, subtle, relentless. And when every one of us and, and everyone around us is self-defined as a Christian, listens to the gospel story regularly, smiles in appreciation when we pray in the name of Jesus, we drop our guard and suppose that all that idle business is behind us. We're home free. We assume that we're free to concentrate on getting rid of the conspicuous trespasses of morality written in the second tablet of the law. No longer need to be vigilant regarding the easily camouflaged spiritual sins in the first tablet. 
The moment came when I was forced to come to terms with my naivete regarding this condition in which my work is done, this condition of congregation, parallel to the denomination. <clears throat> the first thing I did in my work developing a new church in the suburban community in which I was sent was to walk down the streets that curved through these tracts of new houses, knock on the doors, tell them that I was organizing a new church, ask if I could talk to them. Sometimes I got invited in. Occasionally there was a spark of interest. Day after day I did that. I disliked this work exceedingly. I disliked being treated with suspicion by the men and women who came to the door. I disliked the rudeness with which I was often dismissed, making me feel like a peddler of snake oil. But I didn't see any way out of it, so with neither staff nor bag, I abandoned dignity and doggedly went ahead and did it. The one pleasure that I took in that unhappy work was obeying Jesus by shaking the dust off my feet as I retreated from doors closed in hostility or indifference. It was a dominical command that I was glad to obey. But a few people said yes, a few people were interested in the six weeks I had accumulated enough yeses, interest, sparks to think I might start a church, get a quorum at least of the two or three that Jesus settled as a minimum. And I announced the first service in the basement of my home. Forty-six people showed up. We sat on folding chairs in an unfinished basement. It was winter. It was a lot of mud. It was obvious we would have to build a sanctuary. People gathered, invited friends. They made financial commitments. We employed an architect. And in two and a half years, we had a sanctuary built. I did not enjoy the work of those two and a half years. I did it because it had to be done. I did it with my whole heart because I wanted to be a pastor and have a congregation that I could lead in the worship of God. I was pleased that these people were willing to forego their comforts of a pew for a few years, give their time, their money, their leadership to form a congregation, construct a building, so we could provide a place for people to come and worship God in the community. And now this organizational work was over. The construction was complete. We could spend all our time now on our real work of work, of worship, and of mission. I had no reason to not suppose that everyone felt the way I did. And then I got one of the big surprises of my life. After two or three weeks of celebrative gathering in our new sanctuary, attendance began to decline. I couldn't understand what was going on. I visited the people, I asked them, I probed, and um, to my dismay, I found that there was nothing wrong. They had no complaints. It was just that now there was nothing to do. The challenge had been met successfully. I was advised by my denominational superiors to start new projects immediately, recapture the people's enthusiasm with what one of them said they could get their hands on. Well, I figured the only thing they could get their hands on was an idol. And I thought that we were there to worship God, to love our neighbors, live into a holy mystery. There were a few people there who were also there to worship God and practice love of neighbor and learn how to go into mission. And they stayed and they matured and they glorified God, but not nearly as many as I thought. It turned out that far more people than I would have guessed helped develop and build the new church because it was a religious project, an idol that gave meaning and focus and something worthwhile, something suggestive of transcendence, but they were not interested in God. Worshiping God was not emotionally exciting. Loving neighbors was not ego satisfying. And they drifted away. And they went on to get involved in other community projects. And that great surge of enthusiasm beginning that we had fell back like a receding tide. We went to work, hard work of worship, love, witness, 
the spiritual geography of every congregation, and I think I insist on this, is mapped east of Eden. In this self, in this land, self is sovereign. The catechetical instruction we grow up with has most of the questions couched in the first person. How can I make it? How can I maximize my potential? How can I develop my gifts? How can I overcome my handicaps? How can I cut my losses? How can I increase my longevity and live happily ever after, preferably all the way into eternity? Most of the answers to these questions include the suggestion that a little religion along the way wouldn't be a bad idea. Now, there's a little extra spin that's put on these questions for the people who gather in congregations. And pastors who have a reputation for being knowledgeable in matters of religion are expected to legitimize and encourage the religious dimensions of their aspirations. And in our eagerness to please and forgetful of this penchant for idolatry in the human heart, we too readily leave the scene of worship with freely offered emotional and religious jewelry the people bring, fashion a golden calf god, and proclaim a feast to the Lord. Hardly knowing what we do, we meld the religious aspirations of the people and the religious dynamics of the occasion and satisfy everybody. There are a thousand ways to be religious without submitting to Christ's lordship. And people are practiced in most of them. Religious feeling runs high in this golden calf country, but it's far removed from what was said and done on Calvary. While everyone has a hunger for God, deep and insatiable, none of us has any great desire for it. What we really want to do is be our own gods and then have whatever other gods are around to help us in this work. And these people who gather in congregations are trained from an early age to be discriminating consumers on their way to higher standards of living. And we shouldn't be surprised when they expect pastors to help them do it. But it's a great apostasy when we go along with them. And Moses said to Aaron, what did this people do to you that you brought a great sin upon them? Aaron's excuse is embarrassingly lame, but it's more than matched by the justifications we pastors make for abandoning, abandoning worship in our enthusiasm to make congregational life flourishingly successful. That's why it's so hard. I could spend time now talking about the ego the way that plays into it, but I think I've said enough about that. I'm going to skip all that for a minute and just say that these conditions in which we work, denomination, congregation, and ego, are inescapable and powerful. It does nothing useful to rail against them, to blame denomination, blame congregation, blame self. But if we are to repudiate a promising career in religion and avoid this, this slavery to idols, escape the ironic vanity, we're going to have to put together a strong defense. And this defense, which also is a kind of offense, is a stasis. It begins in the condition that's closest to home, in the ego, in the self. In time, congregation and institution get included, but the ego is the place to start. We don't start by reforming congregation. We don't start by reforming denomination. We start with me, with you. The ego is the playing field, the praying field for an escasis. In the story of Jonah, escasis is achieved in the belly of the fish, this place of confinement, of severe and inescapable limits. Let me just go over this old ground again to make sure we're all at the same place. The reason we need escasis 
is that we are under constant satanic seduction to be as gods. The seductive pull is aggravated by the place, denomination, congregation, in which we do our work. But it doesn't begin there. It begins within. The seduction is basically religious, and like all seductions, appears to be a wonderful thing. We transcend mortality, break through limits, expand our influence, live up to our potential, take over Eden, no longer willing to be obedient, content to be obedient. Adam and Eve obedient, tending the garden, naming the animals, holding sweet converse with our Lord in the evening. We're infected with this, with this Luciferian hubris. We get a taste for something truly visionary. Ye shall be as gods. Indeed. Ascasis is a calculated and deliberate interference with this god lust, this god presumption. All of us are familiar with the frequently beneficial effects of involuntary ascasis. How many times have we heard as we visit a parishioner in the days following a heart attack, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. I'll never be the same again. It woke me up to the reality of my life, to God, to what is important. And suddenly, this person, who has been mindlessly and compulsively pursuing an abstraction, success or money or happiness, this person is reduced to what is actually there, to the immediately personal, family, geography, body, and begins to live freshly now in love and appreciation firsthand. And the change is a direct consequence of a forced realization of human limits. You're in the belly of the fish, pulled out of the fantasy of a God condition, a Tarshish destination, Surprised now to be living not a diminished life, but a deepened life. Not a crippled life, but a zestful life. God intensity now begins to replace self-absorption. Mature wisdom begins to seep into where there was only self-importance. We see that all the time, don't we? Don't you hear that all the time? Another form of involuntary escasis that's been conspicuously life-deepening, reality-creating, has been imprisonment. Some of the best passages in our two testament were written by Paul in prison and by St. John in prison. John of the Cross in the Toledo prison, Martin Luther King in the Birmingham jail, Alexander Solzhenitsyn in the Gulag. The enormous spiritual creative energies that result from confinement in a cell, there are other instances of involuntary escapes. We come across them all the time. Unemployment, divorce, bereavement, the exile of moving to a new place. None of these acts of limitation or confinement in itself produces a deepened and more authentic life, but they provide the conditions by which it becomes possible. That's involuntary disaster. Now, escasis is what I'm calling voluntary disaster. We look at the way in which all these various disasters, sickness, heart attacks, imprisonment, divorce, bereavement, serve as advances in spirituality among our friends and the people we admire across the centuries, and we say, why wait? Why wait for an accident? Why wait for a heart attack? Why wait for an illness, a failure? Why not take deliberate steps right now to rid myself of these daily exacerbated illusions of being a god? Why don't I find out a way to study the limits of my mortality in a regular, deliberate way? 
sink myself into the quite marvelous but sin-obscured realities of present creation and present salvation. The basic necessity for and the nature of ascesis has been badly obscured in our time by a kind of chatty devotionalism, the honking of spiritual disciplines as if spirituality were a kind of a mood that you can self-induce, and spiritual disciplines were techniques that you can use to tend to the well-being of your souls when you feel like doing them, like going to a cafeteria and picking out some stuff that looks for like the right thing. <coughs> There's nothing formulaic in this, nothing technological. We cannot take a consumer approach to escasis, to the spiritual life. There's got to be something now grown, organic, customized to who I am, who you are, in your condition, in the condition of your denomination, your congregation, your ego. This consumerist mentality and spirituality is something new, but it's rampant in our times, and we have to do everything we can to combat it. And we begin by insisting that escasis is not spiritual technology at our beck and call. It's not a technique we learn in order to become spiritual or induce spirituality. It's immersion in an environment, the belly of the fish, in which our capacities are reduced to nothing or nearly nothing, and we're at the mercy of God to shape his will in us. And Jesus took the story of the belly of the fish to illuminate the nature of his own escasis. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the whale, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That's it. That's Jesus' escasis. The burial of Jesus in the Arimathean's tomb was the end of hope, the end of religion. Everything that men and women of the ages have hoped to gain from God ended right there. Jesus in the belly of the fish is the place where we begin to understand the way escasis works in our lives. The events of Holy Week have long provided Christian imaginations with the structure and materials for living ourselves into this wholeness and maturity of the gospel. And it's regrettable, but I think it's significant, symptomatic, that Holy Saturday, the next to last event in that eight-day week, is virtually ignored by most of us. It's the most under-celebrated event in Jesus' life. And because it's so weakly imagined and so slightly noticed, Christian escasis is also weakly imagined and slightly practiced. I'm convinced that a recovery of escasis, which I think is so essential given the desperate conditions in which we work, <coughs> begins not with a suggestion of something you do, but with a recovery of the imagination. What image do we have for escasis? Well, Jonah and Jesus provide it. Jonah in the fish's belly, Jesus in Joseph's tomb, Holy Saturday. Confinement turns into concentration, illusion, transmutes now into hope, death exchanges to resurrection. I'm trying to let these Jesus and Jonah stories permeate my mind, my memory, and so to recover this force of escasis in my own life, I remembered a piece of long forgotten history, personal history. It's the story of Pretty Feather, and I want to read it for you. Pretty Feather placed two buffalo head nickels on the countertop for her Holy Saturday purchase, smoked ham hocks. I wrapped them in white butcher paper. Four smoked ham hocks, two for a nickel. In the descending hierarchy of Holy Saturday foods, ham hocks were at the bottom. Large hickory smoked hams held center position in the displays in my father's butcher shop. 
colorful cardboard cutouts provided by salesmen from the meatpacking companies of Armour, Hormel, Silver Bow, all showed variations on a theme. A father had an Easter Sunday dinner table carving a ham, surrounded by an approving wife and scrubbed expectant children. Off to the side of these displays were stacks of the smaller and cheaper picnic hams. There were no company supplied pictures nor even brand names on them. A picnic ham is not, properly speaking, a ham at all, but the shoulder of the pig. People who do not have money for a real ham buy them. Customers sort themselves into upper and lower socioeconomic strata by buying either a real ham or a picnic ham. Pretty Feather bought ham hocks. She is the only person I ever remember buying ham hocks on Holy Saturday. Pretty Feather was the only Indian I knew by name in the years of my childhood and youth, although I grew up in Indian country. Every Saturday she came into our store to make a small purchase, pickled pig's feet, chitlings, blood sausage, head cheese, pork liver. On Holy Saturday, customers crowded into our store, responding to the sale signs painted on the plate glass windows fronting on Main Street, the affluent buying honey-cured, hickory-smoked hams, and the less-than-affluent buying unadjectived picnics. Pretty Feather bought four ham hocks, four bony pig knuckles, gristly on the inside, leathery on the outside, but smoked, and therefore emanating the aroma of a feast. She was always by herself. She wore moccasins, was wrapped in a blanket even in the warmest weather. The coins she used for her purchases were in a leather pouch that hung like a goiter at her neck. Her face was the color and texture of the moccasins on her feet. Indian was a near mythological word for me, full of nobility and beauty, filled out with stories of the hunt and sacred ceremony. Somehow it never occurred to me that this Indian squaw who came into our store every Saturday and bought barely edible meats belonged to that nobility. While she made her purchases from us and whatever other shopping she did on those Saturdays in town, her husband and seven or eight other Indian braves sat on apple boxes in the alley behind the pastime bar and passed a jug of Thunderbird wine. Several jugs, actually. As I made my backdoor deliveries of steaks and hamburger to the restaurants along Main Street, I passed up and down the alley several times each Saturday and watched the empty jugs accumulate. Late in the evening, Benny Odegaard, son of one of the bar owners and a little older than me, would pull them into his dad's pickup truck, drive them out south of town to their encampment along the Stillwater River and dump them out. <laughs> Social services. I don't know how Pretty Feather got back to that small cluster of tar paper shacks and teepees walked, I guess, carrying her small purchases. On Holy Saturday, she carried four ham hocks. Not that I'd ever heard of a Saturday, any Saturday, designated as holy. It was simply Saturday. If once a year precision was required, it was the Saturday before Easter. It was one of the heaviest work days of the year. Beginning early in the morning, I carried the great fragrant hams shipped from Armour in Spokane, Hormel in Missoula, Silver Bow in Butte, arranged them symmetrically in pyramids. We had advertised all week long. Saturday was the commercial climax to the week. Holiness was put on hold till Sunday. Saturday was for working hard and making money. And it was a day when the evidence of hard work and its consequence, money, became publicly apparent. The evidence was especially clear on this particular Saturday when we sold hundreds of hams to deserving Christians and four ham hocks to an Indian squaw and her pickup load of drunks. The Saturday pinned between Good Friday and Easter was one of the high energy work days of the year with no thought of holiness. I grew up in a religious home which believed devoutly in the saving benefits of the death of Jesus and the glorious life of resurrection. 
But between those two polar events of the faith, we worked a long and lucrative day. I would have been very surprised and somewhat unbelieving to have known that in the very town in which I worked furiously all those unholy Saturdays, there were people besides the Indians who were not working at all and not spending either, but remembering. Entering into the despair of a world disappointed in its grandest hopes, entering into the emptiness of death by deliberately emptying the self of illusion and indulgence and self-importance, keeping vigil for Easter, watching for the dawn, and some of them listening to this Holy Saturday sermon. I quote, something strange is happening on earth today, a great silence and stillness. The whole earth keeps silence because the king is asleep. The earth trembled and is still because God has fallen asleep in the flesh and he has raised up all who have slept ever since the world began. God has died in the flesh and hell trembles with fear. He has gone to search for our first parent as for a lost sheep. Greatly desiring to visit those who live in darkness and in the shadow of death, he has gone to free from sorrow the captives, Adam and Eve, he who is both God and the son of Eve. The Lord approached them, bearing the cross, the weapon that had won him the victory. At the sight of him, Adam, the first man he had created, struck his breast in terror and cried out to everyone, My Lord be with you all. Christ answered him, And with your spirit. He took him by the hand and raised him up, saying, Awake, O sleeper, and rise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. That's the end of the quote from an old sermon. As it turned out, I interpreted the meaning of the world and the people around me far more in terms of the hard work on Saturday than anything said or sung on Friday and Sunday. Whatever was told me in those years, and I have no reason to doubt that I heard much truth, what I absorbed in my bones was a liturgical rhythm in which the week reached its climax in a human workday the results of which were enjoyed on Easter. Those assumptions provided the grid for a social interpretation of the world around me. Saturday was the day for hard work or for displaying the results of hard work, namely money. If someone appeared neither working nor spending on Saturday, there was something wrong, catastrophically wrong. The Indians attempting a hungover Easter feast on ham hocks were the most prominent exhibit. It was a view of life shaped by the gospel according to America. The rewards were obvious and I enjoyed them. I still do. Hard work pays off. I learned much in those years I will never relinquish. It might seem ungrateful to cavil now, but there was one large omission that set all the other truth dangerously at risk, the omission of holy rest, the refusal to be silent, the obsessive avoidance of emptiness, the denial of any experience and any people in the least bit suggestive of God-forsakenness. It was far more than an annual ignorance of Holy Saturday. It was religiously fueled arrogance weekly. Not only was the, was Good Friday, was the Good Friday crucifixion bridged into the Easter resurrection with his day furious with energy and lucrative with reward, but all the gospel truths were likewise set as either introductions or conclusions to the human action which displayed our prowess and our virtue every week of the year. God was background to our business. Every gospel truth was maintained intact, and all the human energy was wholly admirable, but the rhythms were wrong. The proportions were wildly skewed. Desolation, and with it companionship with the desolate, ranging from first century Semites, 20th century Indians, all but wiped out of consciousness. 
came a point which I was convinced that it was critically important to pay more attention to what God does than what I do and to find daily, weekly, yearly rhythms that would get that awareness into my bones. Holy Saturday for a start. And then as I had opportunity to visit people in despair and learn their names and wait for resurrection. Embedded in my memory now, this most poignant irony. Those seven or eight Indians with the Thunderbird empties lying around, drunk in the alley behind the pastime bar on Saturday afternoon, while we Scandinavian Christians worked diligently late into the night, oblivious to the holiness of the day. The Indians were in despair, religious despair, something very much like the Holy Saturday despair narrated in the Gospels. Their way of life had come to nothing. The only buffalo left of them engraved on nickels, a couple of which one of their squaws had paid out that morning for four bony ham hocks. The early sacredness of their lives was a wasteland, and they, God forsaken as they supposed, drugged their despair with Thunderbird and buried their dead visions and dreams in the alley behind the pastime, ignorant of the God at work beneath their experienced emptiness. Escasis. If you're convinced of the need for escasis, then we need to construct it. And this is the hard part, for in the ordinary course of things, God does not appoint a fish to swallow you and put you in the place and time of prayer. You have to find your own place, carve out your own time. It's hard because however necessary we believe it to be, it does not feel necessary except occasionally. On most days of our lives, there's neither pressure nor pain enough to lure us into this place. And there will be plenty of other pressures and lures to do something quite other and different. The components for building an escasis are simple enough, a place, a time, a closet, a clock, a sanctuary, some silence. Anybody can manage that for a while. It's the dailiness that's difficult. The usual American counsel that's given at this point, namely the diligent application of willpower, is singularly ineffective, as all of you can testify. Most pastors in company of multitudes of well-intentioned Christians have prayer closets that are a midden of failed resolves. What is required is something large enough to give our spirituality breathing room and ample space for a great variety of circumstances, moods, and levels of growth. The most conspicuous construction of a workable escasis is the monastery. Now, the genius of the monastery is its comprehensiveness. All the hours of the day are defined by prayer. All the activities of the monks is understood by prayer. Hour by hour, day by day, year by year, this external comprehensiveness penetrates the community and the soul. The life of prayer is interiorized and socialized both at the same time. But pastors aren't monks, and we don't live in, in monasteries. Is it possible to construct a pastoral escasis that is workable outside a monastery. Herbert Butterfield, who was an Oxford historian of modern history, that wrote some remarkable things about the life of prayer and the life of faith. He was convinced that Christians praying, a few Christians praying, have far more effect in world history than anything in war and diplomacy technology or art. And he was also convinced that what pastors did vocationally was a major component in that praying. 
And when he was an old man, he was writing some things to this regard, asking pastors to recover our original ground. Now, this is from a historian who cares about the way the modern world works. And in one place, he says this, if I desired to say perhaps one thing that might be remembered for a while, I would say that sometimes I wonder at dead of night whether during the next 50 years Protestantism may not be at a disadvantage because a few centuries ago it decided to get rid of the monks. Since it followed that policy, a greater responsibility falls on us to give something of ourselves to contemplation and silence, listening to the still small voice. That's what I want to do. That's what I've been trying to do, invite you to do. The walls of the monastery are not the critical thing. We're not going to get those. The prayer of the monastery is the critical thing. Finding a way to define all the hours of the day as a life of prayer. A form large enough to include everything that we're doing in the life of prayer. A prayer-defined life a customized ascesis. If we think of ascesis as just a discipline, uh, something that'll help us to do our work, we're, all we're doing is cubbyholing this large requirement. What we need is something huge, something that will take everything we are and reconstruct it. We're not just wanting a prop for another religious job. We're trying to find the belly of the fish out of which we can live in a new vocation. My time is up. What Jonah did in the belly of the fish is pray. And what he prayed was something he learned from the Psalms. The prayer that Jonah prayed is derivative from Psalms. The Psalms are the school of prayer. I'm convinced that the use of the Psalms becomes the monastery for our vocation. I've written of that as well as I can in Answering God, the little book Answering God. And what I would like to do right now is just read you that book, but you're not going to stand for it. <laughs> so I'm just going to stop at this point and, and leave. What, what I mostly wanted to do tonight was convince you of the absolute desperate need for an escasis. Not give it to you, but say only this, that I think the Psalms are key to it, and tomorrow in our talk back, we can discuss some of that in more detail. Thank you. <laughs>